I first I'm going to talk on reconstruction of skull. Okay? Yes, which yes, is very uh, as you know which is very important topic for trauma. And then after that I will talk on decompression. But you know what I will talk on decompression in the way I feel like and in the f- way I think it is correct and in the way I think it should never be done. Essentially, I have a feeling which is very, very contradictory to most of the people in the world. My feeling is maybe I will talk to you about that after I finish my lecture on reconstruction. Okay? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So you can see my slide, uh, Ipe? Yes, sir. Yes, you sir. Can we can see, see my. Yes, we can see. Okay. So you know what? The scalp is the most vascular skin most vascular skin and when it bleeds it bleeds furiously and when it bleeds there are some special ways to control that bleeding it is not the bleeding of the skin of the abdomen or the hand the control of bleeding of the scalp is completely absolutely in a special way that we all know the other thing that we must know you know when we talk about trauma is when there is injury of the skull the whole brain is a very protected environment it is i call a sacred environment or a spiritual environment there is not a single bacteria inside that environment and that environment is enclosed by the dura the dura is the compact cavity and it encloses the brain in such a manner that it will not allow any small little bacteria to enter into the skull into the brain that is one beauty you see the brain is surrounded by nose by ear by all kind of uh, nasopharynx sphenoid sinus there are so many bacteria outside the skull but not a single bacteria inside the skull and that separation that mar- that compartmentalization is absolutely given by the dura so we have to remember that this compartmentalization has to be maintained so also i must before i start my lecture i must say that brain has some special powers you see when the head gets injured when the skull gets injured even the brain matter can come out and lot of you know mark stones garbage can go inside the skull cavity but how many brain abscesses have we seen following trauma i have to say that brain abscess following trauma is an absolutely rare phenomenon because there are some special reparative mechanisms of the brain which does not allow infection to occur it can occur you see meningitis can occur infection can occur uh, brain abscesses can occur but they are extremely rare the amount of trauma you know in mumbai there are about 150 skull fractures daily in mumbai and there are several deaths in mumbai due to trauma which is of course due to severe trauma but skull fractures are 150 daily and the brain matter dura matter injury is at least 10 or 15 daily how many brain abscesses have been seen i will say in my you know in my career i have not seen a single brain abscess related to trauma i have seen abscess due to ear um, infection due to various other kinds of things but not due to trauma so brain is a special compartment brain is a spiritual compartment it is covered by lot of blood vessels scalp is the most vascular structure vascular skin and apart from the scalp you see the vascularity of the various facial layers the gallia the pericranium the facial layers surrounding the temporalis muscle are extremely vascular structures the other thing i want to touch is you see when there is a basal fracture and when there is a csf leakage you know that that leakage can kill the person 
And at that time, it is absolutely critical or crucial to do a good reconstruction. And also at that time, it is critical to do vascularized pedicle reconstruction. Okay, so I will now, you see, this is the scalp and there are multiple blood vessels, middle, the deep temporal arteries, anterior, posterior, middle, deep temporal artery, superficial temporal artery. There is a facial layer, deep temporal fascia, fascia superficial temporal fascia, and this fascia continues. Another beautiful thing, I you are listening. Sir, I, I'm, I'm listening. I'm here, sir. Yeah, I have to say one beautiful concept. You know, we say that the dural, the fascia finishes here or fascia ends here. Fascia never ends. Dura never ends. This is like a folded membrane, folded, and the whole body is of folded membranes. Membranes are the mother, dura mother, arachnoid mother, pia mother. So these membranes are completely folded to make the whole body. Similarly, you see the superficial layer of the deep temporal fascia, the deep temporal fascia, and then there is a gallial layer, and then there is another layer that we have described, I will show you, a subgallial fascia, subgallial fascia, which is also a very vascularized structure. So I will now show you how to reconstruct the skull and the skull base in the event of tumors, in the event of skull base surgery, and in the event of CSF leakage. So one must remember that the superficial temporal fascia, the deep temporal fascia are all continuous with the pericranial layer. There is no marginalization. That it doesn't end here. It is continuous. Gallia is continuous. So between the gallia and the subgallial layer, there is a movement. You see, we can move our scalp. We can move our scalp in the subgallial plane. And this movement is also an absolutely protective nature's miracle. You see, this movement is, an, is a protective phenomena of the body. So we must remember these small little things. One thing is the facial layer. You see this facial layer I have shown here? These are continuous. It, co it just covers the whole skull. These are continuous. These are huge membranes. And also we must remember something we do not remember and something we do not recognize and something we do not use is these are vascularized pedicle flaps. And I have to tell you that we have to know and we have to learn these vascularized flaps. So I'm going to show you some alternative methods of reconstruction, alternative methods. My keywords are, they are all locally, locally available, and they are all vascularized pedicles. Suppose we are going to do this tumor, which is inside the skull and outside the skull. Suppose we are going to do this tumor, middle fossa coming out of the skull. You must know that you can remove the tumor and you can remove the whole tumor, but then you have to make a very strong reconstruction and you have to make a small, very strong and very, very strong reconstruction because you do not want to communicate a spiritual cavity with the zoo of animals in the paranasal sinuses. You do not want to communicate the most spiritual compartment with the most anim animated compartment of the body, which is the nasopharynx and the oral pharynx. You know, the number of bacteria, animal biomass in these two cavities, you cannot even imagine. They're whole loaded with bacteria. And then if we have to remove this tumor, we have to make a very solid compartmentalization. And that compartmentalization has to be so strong that we maintain the spirituality of this brain. That is very important. So I will show you some techniques which I have described of skull base and convexity reconstruction based on vascularized flaps vascularized pedicle flaps, those are all locally available. And you see this case I had done in 1994 or 1993, so about 27 years ago. 
You see, this is the tumor, olfactory groove meningioma, and it is coming in the nasopharynx. You see this tumor? Hype, you can see this tumor? Yes, sir. I can see this. See, this is the tumor, and it is going in the nose. Either you remove it or you do not remove it. But if you plan to remove it, then you have to give a very solid reconstruction. So 1993, I think I did this. So this is the tumor. And I described this vascularized. I split the cranium here. And then I took a vascularized pericranial flap. And then I turned it over the base after removing the tumor. You can see that? So this is the reconstruction. This is the bone reconstruction here on the skull base. And this bone has been taken from here. Can you see this? This bone has been taken from here and it has been plugged here. And this is in 1994, I described this vascularized bone flap for anterior skull base reconstruction. It is, of course, controversial whether you need bone flap or you do not need bone, whether you can use just pericranium, whether you can use just fascia, or whether you want to use just fat. But this is an alternative. My feeling is you put your reconstruction vascularized flap, and then you rotate a vascularized flap, and you can do a beautiful reconstruction. So you saw this. Now you see this another case. There is a CSF leakage in a big hole in the middle fossa here, quite a huge hole. And there is air bubble here and there is air bubble here. This case also I did about 25 years ago. And now when you are going to do this reconstruction and this patient is having continuous CSF leakage from the ear, now you have to do a very beautiful reconstruction here. So you can, you first plug this with fat and all those things, and then you can do a vascularized flap based on the temporalis muscle. So you can do, you see, this is a vascularized osteomyoplastic flap. You can put the flap along with the bone along the skull base. After, if you want to use fat, if you want to use other fascia, you can of course use it. But this is a vascularized, so what I have done is I have, you see, I have taken the split bone here and I have rotated the muscle here. You see the osteomyoplastic flap and I have done reconstruction by taking some bone here and putting the bone here. So split here, here. And this I published in 1994, vascularized osteomyoplastic flap for skull base reconstruction. So this is another kind of flap that can be used. This is another tumor. You see the whole skull is having a tumor. And in, it is in the forehead. You see, I'm not sure if you can see it properly, but there is a tumor here. Now, if you want to remove this tumor, there will be a huge skull base defect, uh, convexity defect. Of course, nowadays you can use titanium and you can use all these kind of uh, fancy material but 25 years, 30 years ago, these things were not available. But my feeling is that you have to do a beautiful reconstruction and vascularized pedicle reconstruction is the best. So what we have done is you see here, we have split the skull here and this is the superficial and deep temporal fascia with the blood vessels. And this is the temporalis muscle and there is a long, you see, we have split and we have retained the facial layer and then split the skull and then rotated the skull. So this is a long vascularized split cranial bone flap. So you see there is a split here and the bone flap is now reconstructing the forehead if you can see it beautifully here. So this is a long vascularized pedicle convexity reconstruction. So essentially you can realize that you can split here and you can rotate the flap. You can rotate it in all directions in circumferential rotation. You can rotate it here, you can rotate it back and you can rotate it all in the, and also the vascularized pedicle. If you give a vascularized pedicle, 
the most vascular structure of the body, if you can retain, you can have a live skull base reconstruction. So you see here, there are various layers of the temporalis fascia. One is superficial layer of temporalis fascia. One is the deep layer of temporalis fascia. Then there is a gallial layer. And then we had described a subgallial fascia. So fascia, you see subgallial fascia. You must remember this is also a well-defined layer which can be used for reconstruction. And you can have a long vascularized flap. So there is temporalis muscle here. There is superficial and deep temporalis fascia here. There is pericranium here. And there is subgallial fascia. So you can have extended subgallial fascia, pericranial temporalis muscle based flap, which we described for skull based reconstruction. And I can tell you, believe me, whether you want to believe me or not, that is upon you. But I can tell you, this is a beautiful flap. And this flap can be used for tumor surgery, following chordoma surgery of the middle cranial fossa. It, I have seen, you know, some people have described the use of this flap following endoscopic surgery. They take it laterally from the nose. So the, this flap is a versatile flap and it is a locally available alternative. It can be hugely rotated. I must tell you that I have never used this artificial glue or artificial uh, sealing material or, or never in my, I don't know what these things are. I have always used vascularized pedicle flaps, and this is one beautiful flap you can see for skull base reconstruction. Now I will show you extended vascularized temporalis muscle fascia flap. Muscle fascia. So there is a extended muscle fascia flap. So you see here, this is the temporalis muscle. And you cut this muscle here, this facial fa uh, layers here, and rotate them up. And then you can rotate this. You see, this becomes a long flap. And you can also use this pericranium. And cut the muscle here and rotate it. If you have done glomus jugularis surgery, if you have done some mastoid surgery, if you have done huge petrosectomy, if you have done petrous apex removal, if you have communicated you see various cavities to the sphenoid sinus, to the clivus and all those things. You can use this beautiful, this is just beautiful temporalis muscle fascia flap. Now you see here, another case I'm showing you. There is a huge, uh, John, there is some noise coming in between. Yeah, I got it. Got it? Okay. okay. Now you see there is a huge middle cranial fossa defect. And you see the whole brain is herniating into the middle cranial fossa. You can see the temporal, uh, temporal brain herniating into the, into the ex infratemporal fossa and into the nasal cavity. You see here? And you see there is a CSF leakage coming from the ear. There is some CSF seen. So I did this case about 25 years ago. Now you see, I am, I am wondering, I, I want to ask this question to the young people in the audience, what they will like to do for such a case. I will like to them, I will just wait for a few seconds for them to think what they will like to do in this situation. You see, you cannot do reconstruction by in this situation by forcing it fat and all those things. Of course you can do it, but you will have to do a vascularized pedicle reconstruction. Now you see here, what I did was a multi-layer facial uh, reconstruction. This was a life-threatening condition. This guy, this young boy had come with CSF leakage and with a situation where he was having multiple episodes of meningitis and all those things. So he needed a solid reconstruction. So what is done here, you see these beautiful line drawings which I made. This is the temporalis muscle and the fascia. So I cut here and this is a long flap. This is a vascularized flap, temporalis muscle fascia flap. 
then what you can do is you can make the distal layer thick. You see, you can cut here and rotate partially this, this part of the fascia. So this part, the distal part becomes thick and multi-layered. So what has been done is this distal part has been cut like this and first rotated in the middle cranial fossa base. And then this temporalis osteomyoplastic flap has been rotated and put in the, so there is a multi-layered vascularized pedicle reconstruction of the skull base. You see first this one will go like this and then this one will go and there will be a multi-layer reconstruction of the skull base. So this is actually multi-layered reconstruction of the middle cranial fossa floor, okay? Now I will show you another case, a very big VIP patient, the son of a VIP who was a minister at that time in a, uh, you know, in the union ministry. And his son had suffered a trauma and he developed CSF leakage from the nose. And after CSF leakage, he was operated 13 times, four or five times from the nose to stop the leakage. Then shunts were done, the lumbar peritoneal shunt was done and various kinds of procedures, 13 times. And a big man, a big man's son. He was, when I treated him, he had already, you know, he was about 27, 28 year old. And now you see the ventricle is large you see the ventricle is huge and it is the whole thing is coming in the, the ventricle is herniating into the paranasal sinus. And also because there were multiple operations done, you see there are so many holes in the skull base. Every time somebody used to go, he used to make additional holes and the holes were around the internal carotid artery. You see here, internal carotid artery is almost exposed around the around the uh, skull base defect. And you see the multiple defects in the skull base and the whole ventricle is coming. I want to ask the young people in the audience, I will give them a few minutes. I want them to think as to what they will be doing in this situation. You see, this is a life-threatening condition and I got phone calls from various people and I will not like to boast this, but even from the topmost in our country, phoned me for this gentleman saying that now do something otherwise this gentleman is gone and finished 27 year old healthy and a very intelligent young man so I did this reconstruction I will like to show you so what we did is there is, this is one layer of reconstruction you see this is one huge because he was operated so many times there was nothing in the frontal skull it was completely barren all the layers had been taken, pericranial layers for reconstruction. So I use this long facial pericranial flap from here. You see this here? And rotated it down here. Like this is one layer of reconstruction. You saw this? So this is a vascularized pedicle reconstruction. I did this operation about 25 years ago. And the other thing is at that time, this uh, fibrin glue had just been introduced in the market and this guy brought for me from Singapore, multiple vials of uh, fibrin glue. At that time, it was known as Tisil. And he gave it to me to use it for his son. And I kept it, but I did not use it. And I kept that Tisil for several years till this, it disappeared from my refrigerator because I don't know how to use this t seal business and glue business. You see here, this is a long vascularized reconstruction I did, that is one. Now you see there is another thing. One is this facial layer. And second, what I do is I split the cranium here. So I do a split cranium and then I put one split cranial flap here and multiplayer like here and the guy was cured and he did not need any further surgery for CSF leakage. So this is a multi-layer reconstruction of anterior cranial fossa floor. You see, so when you have a problem of CSF leakage, your operation is like giving new life. So you have to use this pericranium and temporalis fascia and all those things for tumors. If you are doing skull-based tumors, if you are doing malignancies of the skull base, 
And if you are going to do all these kind of complex chordomas of the middle cranial fossa, glomus jugulare tumors, reconstruction has to be solid. You cannot, you know, bypass reconstruction and say, yeah, 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 I have to remove the tumor because you have removed the tumor, but this leakage will will kill the person. So you have to use it. You see how much the vascularized layers you can get. You can harvest the whole skull. You can open the, you see, you can dissect subgallially, hold, uh, get the pericranium, get the gallia, get the facial layers, and you can get the whole skull and do the reconstruction whenever it is necessary. Other thing is, as I mentioned, I don't do decompressive craniectomies at all. At all, no decompressive craniectomies. I think this is an absolute disastrous operation neurosurgeons have devised for the poor patients who are unconscious and all those things. But 30 years ago, this article I had written 30 years ago, when I had, I was, you know, somebody had done, uh, not somebody, you see, this decompressive craniectomies were a common norm. And what I started using is I, you know, you use, you preserve the skull bone in the abdomen, in the thigh. And some people, because, you know, they want to preserve, they preserve it in various kind of refrigeration. And some very intelligent people like to put some expensive titanium material and peak material because that is expensive for the patient and for you know, good for them a little bit. You can use those things. I don't want to criticize these things, but I just do not use them. So you can use the, you can preserve the skull in the subgallial fascia. It is a very vascular compartment. And when the person becomes all right, you can introduce the skull back. So this is skull subgallial reconstruction of the preservation of the thing. My fascination and my passion for vascularized pedicle reconstruction has gone to for the pituitary tumors. You see, pituitary tumors, now we know about Haddad flap and all those things, but <clears throat> 25 years ago, these flaps were not available. So what I use is reconstruction of the cellar floor using vascularized pedicle mucosal flap. You see, there is a sphenoid sinus mucosa you can preserve this mucosa and you can make it like, you see, I'm separating the mucosa from the sphenoid sinus, preserving this mucosa and then putting fat and also adding this vascularized pedicle reconstruction. This flap is being used a little bit, not very commonly, but many people who do endoscopic surgery like to use these flaps. So this is a vascularized pedicle mucosal flap. I also describe this flap, outer layer. Sometimes, you know what? You can use the outer layer of the dura, dura mother. Outer layer of dura I used. You see, you can read this paper. This was published in Surgical Neurology, which was then renamed as World Neurosurgery. But at that time, it was Surgical Neurology. And you can split the dura and you can use it as a pedicle flap for reconstruction here. The mastoid bone was reconstructed using this. I'm not saying you use it always. I'm not trying to say, oh, very good, very good. But I'm giving you some options and alternatives. When you think they are necessary, when you think you can use them, you should try. And you should have options available. This is not that you will split and I cannot split. Oh, it cannot be split. Start arguing with me, all this kind of. What argue? You don't argue. Hello? Uh, huh? John, John just see. Hello? So this is, uh, now this is another patient. Uh, I, are you with me? Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. I'm here. I am showing you another beautiful thing which you have not seen. Beautiful. Yes, you yes, see, yes, we yes. know about uh, CSF cisterno, uh, CT cisternogram, MR cisternogram. We know about introduction of dyes into the skull, and we know how to know how to get the site of leakage. You see, this is a site of leakage. We know how to get, but there are many occasions, and you will agree that there are several occasions where the exact site of leakage cannot be deciphered. You cannot identify where the leakage is coming. 
and you open the skull and you come and you do not find the site of leakage, you can be in a big problem. You agree with that? This can be a big, huge problem. So, yes, yes, yes. so this is another case who is a big VIP of Mumbai. And he was operated several times for by endoscopy and all those things to repair the leak. And when they, you know, he was, the leak persisted and then they did lumbar puncture. The, uh, the whole test tube was full of pus. That kind of difficult situation he was. Then, uh, you know, then he landed with me somehow. And I was not able to exactly find out where exactly is the leak. And I did this 3D model. You see this 3D model? This is the first time in the world this kind of model has been made to identify the leak. And now can you see multiple holes here in the skull? Which, which had to be seen in the frontal sinus, in the region of cribriform plate, in the region of plenum sphenoidal, in the region of anticlinoid process. And there are multiple small holes all around the place. And you have to, you know, if you have to cure him, you have to take care of, of all these things. So this is one new method which we have found out, a 3D model. 3D scan is all right, but model, you can hold the model in your hand and you can go in the theater with that model. This is another case. You see this patient, very big trauma and has been repaired several times. And you see the air in the brain and you see here the huge skull base. And then there is a craniotomy. You can see here, somebody has done a craniotomy, but now he comes to me and he, you see the hole here in the region of ethmoid sinus, in the region of sphenoid sinus in the region, you see the number of holes that he has got like a absolute disaster. My feeling is to cure this person, you need a huge, huge multi-layered vascularized pedicle reconstruction. And you must know that if you can do a good reconstruction, you can good give new life to these patients. And this was my first technical paper in my lifetime in 1992, which was published in British Journal of Neurosurgery. And here what I'm doing is, you see the scalp at the time of closure, you can do this tenting scalp stitch. You stitch the pericranium with the scalp. You can stitch the pericranium with the skull. And you will be surprised many of the young people listening to me will be absolutely surprised that I have never sutured the scalp in two layers in my lifetime. You see, if you go to Cushing grave, you know what is written on Cushing grave? You don't know. Cushing grave, it is written that here lies a man who stitched the scalp in two layers. And if you have, if you, when you, I, you will come to make a grave for me, you remember that you write, here lies a man who stitched scalp in one layer. Okay, you will remember that, I? Okay. But, uh, <laughs> I, I... <laughs> so here are the various flaps that we have described. And I hope you will use these flaps whenever they are required. You will use them judiciously and you will use them effectively. These are the very effective way of compartmentalization of the skull. Skull is a divine cavity. Skull is a spiritual cavity. It contains our brain, the seat of emotions, the seat of thought and seat which can completely change the whole world. So you must remember these beautiful flaps. So thank you very much, I. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the excellent lecture, sir. Uh, any questions for this thing? Any questions for this uh, talk, please? I mean, we missed him yesterday, but thank you very much for coming today and uh, the next day of Diwali and delivering this beautiful talk, sir. Thank you, Aip. And uh, I can only send you my best wishes and my, if you think my blessings, if you think they are appropriate, but because you are now already a very big man in the field, but I can send you my love and affection and I wish that you make this Karad a beautiful center of neurosurgery. And I'm sure without doubt and without hesitation, I can say that you will do it. 
the number of people who attended. Of course, I could not attend because after eight months of Corona thing, for the first time, I ventured out of Mumbai to city Pune with my family. So that was the reason I could not attend yesterday. But I know exactly I was in touch. I know exactly what happened and how it happened. And I'm sure you must be very happy and very proud. I would Can like I to have you? questions. Yes. Questions on my... Uh, so I must say that I must say that whatever I grow into, sir, I will always remain uh, to be your disciple. Uh, somebody as a resident who was fascinated uh, when you 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 achieved so many things, and that yeah. that was what had a lot of a generation of can us. I, can I uh, have a question, sir? No, I have a question sir. also. All right, Hello. Sir. Yes, please. Yes, please. Please take ask ask questions. What is uh, any difference in patients with a frontotemporoparietal decompressive or a under versus a patient undergoing a hinge craniotomy? Hinge decompressive or a four quadrant decompressive, where we are uh, replacing the bone back. Uday, you ask this question to I or to somebody else because you know I told you I never do decompression cranio craniotomy. I never do in my lifetime. I don't think it is a good operation. I don't think it should be done, but I also know that if I make these statements, many of the people who are experts in head trauma will not like it. So I was not here because I was out of town, but also deliberately because my controversial statements can, can become controversy. But I do not think any kind of decompression is a relevant or good operation I want to remove this word decompression from neurosurgery. Dr. Uday, this is my... Um, Thank you, sir. I have a question or comment. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Professor uh, Goel, for uh, this presentation. Actually, uh, what uh, those who follow Dr. Goel uh, publications or presentation know that uh, he like to share philosophy and I like this concept uh, very much and uh, sharing philosophy and give, it, give us some idea. Uh, for sure, after uh, knowing S Sister Nostomi, if you see the example that uh, I give in the, in the presentation about managing blast injury, that was in 2009 uh, and we are uh, managing like uh, 40, around 40 patients in OR in emergency at the same time. So uh, the resident there or the neurosurgeon there, uh, we call it, they act by default. They are familiar with the um, decompressive craniectomy easier uh, for them. But uh, for sure, uh, I hope we will not face blast injury anymore. But uh, at this time, yes, we have different strategies after 10 years from those incidents, uh, why uh, um, I can say that we can think uh, 10 times before doing the compressive. That's maybe maybe a lower level of uh, 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 um, um, expectation from the compressive. But yes, uh, I, I will think of uh, Sister Nostomy, Sister Nostomy, and uh, let's say Sister Nostomy what can did for this patient and uh, if possible, many modification rather than decompressive, and I will put it at the final stage. That's what we are doing yes. now in the practice. And yes, uh, regarding the reconstruction, for me, it's uh, interesting. And uh, I think not for me only, uh, other person and colleague will think of this uh, method of reconstruction in situ at the end of surgery. Why not? We can do such a flaps if uh, uh, literature proved uh, effective and uh, your experience means a lot to us, sir. Thank you. You know what? Other thing is, you know, there are, now you will ask me that uh, if not decompressive craniectomies, then what? You will ask me this question. Professor, see, I one... would like this question for you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is one question that my, I will give you my thoughts that I, if the person comes to me with a trauma, 
I will never do decompression, okay? Decompression and bone flap rejection is, is never in my, I have never done it. I do not recommend. And I have seen disasters and I have seen complications. And I think that this divine material, God has given this skull to protect. It is like mother. It is protecting an injured brain. It is protecting a normal brain. It is protecting an injured brain. Don't remove the mother from the baby. Brain is like a very small kid when it is injured. And if you remove the skull, you have removed the protection and you have removed the mother. Don't do it. This is, this is not good. Now you will ask me what is to be done. One is if you can avoid doing anything, like you, if you can do drug treatment, if you can do give some various uh, decongestive drugs and you observe, you see when the person is come unconscious, his brain is very seriously and severely injured. So there are many situations when you can tide over and you can try drugs and if you cannot drugs fail, then the, the cystonostomy that uh, IP is recommended is one option, is one option. There are other options like you see if there are huge frontal brain contusions and temporal lobe contusions, you can do temporal lobectomy, you can do frontal lobectomies and decompress the brain. And by the time you are decompressing the brain, you open the cisterns and also decompress the cisterns. And you will find that you have released the brain quite a bit. Rather than throwing the bone, you can remove the part which is the injured brain, you can remove that is will be my concept. Rather than entering and coming and removing the whole skull and I have seen bilateral craniectomies and all. You see the people who are following trauma and doing trauma work are very happy with what they are doing. But my feeling is, and I am giving you a feeling which is controversial. Like Ipe says, that cystonostomy when he started, you know, everybody started laughing. But now many people in the last World Federation of Neurological Surgery meeting, there was a whole session on cystinostone. There should be a whole session on no decompression should be done. Please leave the heads of the injured people intact. Leave the mother of the baby intact. And the baby needs the head. It needs a protection. Don't just throw away the head. I think, I know there will be many negative opinions about this but this is my opinion. Like if there is an intracerebral hematoma or bleeding, you go and remove the hematoma. Why you have to throw the bone of the skull? Skull removal is a dangerous. All the brain which comes out of the skull and bulges, this completely finished, the person will develop. If the person recovers, he will never recover from hemiplegia. You will see these patients walking with one hand like that and the bulging head, you see, I think there should be a complete session. I hope you think about it. There should be a complete session as to abandoning decompression from the face of neurosurgery. You introduce this session and you concentrate. You, of course, cystonostomy is one way, but there are other ways. You, you, you make a proposal in front of the World Federation or whichever federation or I don't want, I don't know about federations, but you make a proposal in front of the world of neurosurgery that use alternative options. Don't throw away the bones like that unnecessarily. Sir, I've been talking about this for many years. I mean, dec decompression is really, really bad surgery. And uh, I mean, I think we should grow out of it. And now we should grow out of, you know why we are doing, why we are doing, you know what? We say that we do because we cannot do anything else, we at least do something, our hands will keep on moving and uh, stitching will take and remove, some hands will move. And many of the people whose other brain tumors they don't get, they don't get um, uh, spinal disease, they don't get anything, they are just waiting and you know, putting their thumb on their palm and just twiddling their thumbs, they get some trauma and they do okay, let us do this uh, decompression. You see, uh, unnecessarily. You don't know how, you know, I, it is not a minor thing. I am telling you, it is not a minor thing to say like this in front of people who are, and you have been, you know, you have been courageous enough to say that. And I completely admire your courage, how you could stand in front of these people of the neurosurgeons who are you know, completely, many people in the 
neurosurgical world are only familiar with one operation and that is decompressive craniectomies to stand tall in front of these people was must have been a very difficult job and i was you know first time i am actually saying in front of an audience about this otherwise you know i talk to you in private that don't do this nonsense of decompression there is some trauma and person comes and you just remove the bone flap there is some intracerebral hematoma and you just remove the bone flap there are some people who just for you know there are several articles of mine you must read there brain edema is a natural protective maneuvering by the body if there is a brain edema it is a natural protection it is not negative you see this tumor is tumor is primary edema is secondary trauma is primary edema is secondary and whatever is secondary is nature is god is trying to make up the huge injury that you have subjected your brain to brain edema is protective you see tumors you will not know i during 20 25 years ago there were some people for for malignant brain tumor they just used to remove the bone flap you know why the the concept was make the space for the tumor to grow at least the tumor, the brain is this kind of idiotic concepts existed you don't know you see this bone flap has been very badly bashed by the by the neurosurgeons i think there has to be a concentrated effort and i have seen young people you know bone flaps have been removed and a huge depression in the skull and when you remove the bone flap from the left side of the skull the person starts stops talking for life he's he's you know his weakness of the right side is such a huge and you know there are people who are recommending all these kind of foolish things there should be a very big concentrated effort in the world of neurosurgery led by you you make some proposal that these kind of is not not good please please for heaven's sake don't do this kind of foolish thing remove the tumor if it is there deal with the problem of uh, whatever is there some temporal lobe contusion is there do temporal lobectomy frontal lobe contusion do temporal frontal contusion lobectomy if you understand when systemostomy can be helpful when uh, csf drainage from the ventricle can be helpful you see this can be uh, game changers as you know you see you have to know when to do what but one thing you should know never to do one unnecessary thing just because you don't have anything else to do you just do this thing that is a wrong kind of attitude i think we yeah. are having too many neurosurgeons in our country and in our world the number of neurosurgeons should be re- reduced to 10% so that these kind of foolish things can be avoided uh, yes sir yes yes i completely agree with you sir decompression is a criminal but i will i i know uh, i you agree but there will be many people in the audience who will not agree and who yes. are ready to ready to you know bash me and bash you but i don't bother you know now i have gone too far in my career you see to get disturbed by anybody talking bad about me or saying oh what nonsense or oh, go to do whatever you have to do you see other thing if you remember if you know uh, i i have recently said that decompression for carry malformation is a nonsense operation i have said recently there are many people in the audience who putting with stones and coming oh what 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 they'll go to we'll do decompression and another thing which i have recently which you don't know i which recently my several articles in the literature i have said that decompressive laminectomy is an absolutely nonsense operation decompressive laminectomy for degenerative spine or nonsense then decompressive uh corpectomies and all those things complete nonsense this is my recent introduction to neurosurgery so sometimes next time i will you know uh, i we will talk on this decompression as a subject where i will be talking about decompression of the rest of the spine of the brain of the skull as a completely negative redundant operation which should not be done this word decompression should be removed from the from the textbooks of neurosurgery yes sir may i am uh, i can yes i say something yes corredo please okay um no the first question that i would 
ask to, to you uh, how to explain to all my patients that survived after the compressive craniectomy and coming back to work, uh, and how can I explain that uh, they live in a nonsense way? You can uh, explain that despite what you did, despite uh, shooting them in the head, they survived. Correct. Okay. No, 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 just like you know it. what? Just I like will it. tell you. I will uh, like to answer this question. You see, when your brain is injured, no, please, somebody... Atul, please. I can understand, uh, but uh, mm, it doesn't matter if I agree with you or not. It absolutely doesn't matter uh, that you say that something can be uh, bored, offended by your words. Uh, you are. Uh, you have your opinion. You have your huge experience. And of course, your choice, uh, your choice of management is one choice, and and I completely respect your choice. Uh, maybe the message is that uh, we have to think, uh, we have to understand uh, what we are doing or not. And uh, I cannot stand just about the talking of decompressive craniectomy as a surgery. Uh, where there, there is only uh, 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 throw it away the bone. The decompressive craniectomy is a, a complex surgery, and we need also a, a neurointensivist workload uh, and uh, a, a complete approach, even neurosurgical approach and neurointensivist approach. And uh, even yesterday and today, to be honest, maybe. I miss the presence of a neurointensivist uh, to uh, know uh, and to understand which kind of, of, uh, of law uh, of work is behind uh, decompressed patients. Uh, I'm not defending the decompressive craniectomy at all. And uh, nobody of decompressed uh, work, let me use these terms, Nobody defend at all. And uh, ICP rescue and uh, um, rescue ACDH are the proof that that part of uh, uh, neurosurgeons that work with the decompressive craniectomy are searching for the fruit, are searching for the selection of patients, which patient can benefit from decompressive the, the craniectomy and which patient not. Uh, of course, the compressive craniectomy at all is not the solution. So we have to search the through, uh, and we are search the, the way to manage at uh, the best way uh, the uh, traumatic patient. And uh, you know, as I as I show yesterday, and as you know, of course, that uh, 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 the patient in a part of the world is not the same of traumatic patient for another part of the world. And this is fundamental because the, the our experience and the, our um, consideration, even scientific consideration, then clinical consideration could be different, could be different among the uh, group of patients that we treat. Uh, and this is another fundamental uh, thing that we have to keep in mind. So, um, I'm, I'm the only thing that I'm not agree is the, the message is so absolute about uh, the throw away one technique against another techniques. Uh, if the techniques like the compressive craniectomy means that all the people died, I can understand we have to abandon, uh, but I don't think so. And I don't think that all the patients, the compressor die or we get work, uh, we, we get uh, worse in all parts of the world. In some part of the world, the decompressive craniectomy could be not possible because the work uh, of intensivists, the work of monitoring, the work of attention to this kind of patient is not possible. And this is the first thing that I say to IPE when we meet uh, the first time. You write, you are offering a solution in a part of the world where there is no way to uh, decompress, no way to reconstruct, no way to monitor. So 
And uh, the first time that I see uh, uh, the Sister Nostomy on YouTube, I say, this could be a solution in a part of the world, and this could be a solution to bettering the decompressive caniectomy. So uh, it's just but a kind of message, not the message. Uh, Professor Gold, you are a master and, and you and you have a big responsible about the, your words is uh, deep words in the young neurosurgeon. So when you say something, you have to understand, and I know that you understand when you say something, there is a young neurosurgeon that have a mind and can follow you. But unfortunately, there is also some young neurosurgeon that don't have so brilliant mind and can follow just the few words that that young neurosurgeons once follow. So when you suggest something, please, I think that we have also to suggest how to study and how to understand that suggestion, not just follow the suggestion. So Corrado, you have put it in a very beautiful way, beautiful. You have really put, you know, you have really put the whole thing into right perspective. I know that uh, many people in the world are doing decompressive craniectomies. And many people really think it is a good operation. Many people, you know, many people think it is a good operation. It is a useful operation and it should be done and all those things. And many people have got huge experience in these things. And it should be, but it is time, Corrado, that we have to really sit down and try to, and many studies have been done. Many double blind studies have been done. But you see, the trauma is such a huge thing. And the trauma is different in every patient, different kind of injuries. They are not two uh, patients will never have the same kind of injury. So when to do what, when to do something which is not necessary, when we can avoid anything. We, should, we see, as you said, intensive care unit, intensive care management is so important. And it, it has gone such a distance. We should use the services of intensive monitoring, intensive care, rather than just taking the patient and removing the thing if can be avoided, you see. And there are ways to avoid these things. I know I, I know that what these statements, I have never made in my lifetime some of these statements, but I made them today. I had this pent up feeling in me that uh, this decompression is not such a, you know, it is overused and it is much more used than it is necessary in the world. And in many situations, it can be avoided. And in most situations, it can be avoided. This is my feeling. And to the extent, to the extent that now my neurosurgical career is more than 40 years, nearing 40 years, for the last 35 years of my career, I have not resorted to any kind of decompressive craniectomy. And I do not talk from, you know, high pedestal or from ego or pride and all those things. I never like to talk particularly to the young people. But if you, you know, I have my opinion and I have my, uh, you know, I have experienced many head trauma patients by done by various people all over the place by decompression. And then they come to me through various channels. And then I see the, the disaster. So what we have to do is we have to really think and have a forum of discussion of people who are for it, people who are saying that there are alternative options can be used and people who are against and let's discuss it headlong. And when you see, I give my points, you argue out. No, I don't agree at all on this point. I don't agree. Maybe here it is okay, but here it is not okay. And we have one-to-one -one discussion and discussion in a forum where this issue, and you also know that this issue of decompressive craniectomy is being discussed on various, various forums in the world. Recently, it was being discussed in the ethics committee of the World Federation of Neurological Surgery, this was the subject being discussed. So it is not that it is not discussed. And it is not that everybody agrees that uh, this thing can be done and should be done in this kind of patient. So I have a feeling 
that we should have arguments and we should have strong arguments with people who have enough experience and let's sort out this issue of uh, uh, but I have given you my opinion in no uncertain terms in no uncertain terms I have given you my opinion I am not saying that I am the only person in the world who is right and everybody else is wrong I am not trying to say that I am not trying to say that but I am also trying to say that that I am not talking from, you see, I am working in the one of the biggest centers of neurosurgery in the world, one of the busiest centers. And from that experience, I am saying whether somebody has to take, and of course, my decompressive craniectomy thing, I have never published, but I have published on Chiari malformation. Have you read, Corrado, my work on Chiari malformation? On Chiari malformation, I read your work, I follow yeah. your meeting, and uh, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm friend of Massimiliano Visocchi, so you know <laughs> yeah. how we follow yeah. you, and uh, of course. But hey, I, I suppose that maybe it could be more useful the same approach that you have uh, with Chiari. You could, you could have also for a traumatic patient to understand. Yeah. I've so, never published on that. Never. So when, when I decide do not uh, decompress the Chiari, when I decide to block the articulation, uh, I decide because I understand uh, your mood, I understand your choice, I study your choice. Uh, and so the same approach should be done for decompressing craniectomy. When you say don't do this, don't do this at work, uh, you have a big responsibility. And when you say this, you have to say, not because I see that doesn't work. You should at least publish, or you should at least to, to, to uh, explain why not. Um, we are in the same boat because uh, all uh, we, me and Virendra Sinha, Professor Sinha that I say, I'm seeing that he's uh, <laughs> listening to us. Uh, we are I know, the, when the, he's listening, he's listening, uh, you know what, Corrado? Virendra <laughs> is listening, but he is also ready with a gun pointed at me. Virendra, I yes. want your call. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, yeah, yes. Uh, last time we had a webinar on decompressive craniotomy only. So finally, we uh, multicentric study results that at six months of one year we keep the keep the patient in very vegetative state. So we do some changes in guidelines that can make the patient much better. So I think Corona was there also in this webinar. So he was the one of the speakers. So we do some changes rather than very strongly we say it is useless. So we do much some changes, then we should speak. Right? Um, can can, can I say a few words? Um, uh, Barish, uh, yeah. good morning. Yeah, yeah, good morning. Uh, Professor Goel, um, uh, I respect your experience um, and your thought um, as someone who is a leader in this field. Um, and uh, I agree with IF uh, Dr. Goel that I don't want to do a decompressive hemicraniectomy. And I've seen, um, you know, removal of, uh, you know, swollen brain tissue, stroke tissue, along with cisternal decompression is enough for these patients. Um, <clears throat> even though I'm convinced that is it, I, I, you have to understand that I practice in the Western world where I, uh, evidence is uh, the biggest uh, order of signs. Um, and uh, uh, as uh, Corrado pointed out, neurointensivists, neurologists are big uh, players in taking care of trauma patients. Uh, in the intensive care units. Um, so I think it is important to, to publish uh, results of not doing decompression and doing other things. And what are the outcomes? And what are the complications? And how these patients do in large scale from all over the world in big trauma centers. Um, and uh, your experience, like I'm sure you've done, you've not, you, you, you clearly said that you've not done decompression for 35 years and you've managed so many trauma patients. Um, maybe if you can, you can publish your results. You know, I, I, I'm just trying to figure out, I, I'm a believer. I believe that we should not do decompression. I believe that we should not do, but 
how are we going to make the world believe this? How are we going to, when I do that part of the operation, when I do the right thing for my patient, I just want to walk out of the OR and take care of the next patient rather than argue with 10 people that I did the right thing or not, did not do the right thing. I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> you would rather do it rather than getting into discussion. And you see, on the other hand, in a hospital where sometimes, you know, the, the intensivist will say, okay, do it. And if you do not do it, and if you say, I will not do it, the patient will be sent to somebody else. That, you know, because there is so much faith in this operation. So this is a matter for discussion. And I hope that, uh, you know, this uh, question, I hope you, th you think about it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, you know, I think, you know, we, we discussed yesterday, I, I presented that maybe we should do a, a randomized controlled trial. Yeah, um, and I've been thinking about the discussions we had and, you know, Dr. Goyal's talk, and maybe we should not have the randomized controlled trial. But there should be some kind of evidence we need to publish. Prospect to adjudicate it, you know, outcome based. We did not do this that we do every day or everyone what people recommend we do for this. And still the patients are doing okay. And that needs to be published prospectively, multi-center, uh, as a good science. And that should be enough. If we do that, I think I don't think people are going to talk against us. And I believe in it because I want to do that for my patients. I, you know, every time I do not do a decompression, I put a cystinase in the drain, I come out, there is hell broke loose everywhere. <laughs> Right. And I and uh, and, you know, we live in a very litigious environment um, mm. and uh, uh, it is not good if there is no data to support where your actions. Yeah, you're right, Sabarish. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we have it run and we have so many more discussions. This see from 13 years, uh, it's the 14th year that I'm doing it. And uh, you will not believe how the outlook has changed for the whole world. So that is an advancement. I remember doing it uh, in the phase of real, real criticism when uh, I had to fight against everybody. Now we have a lot of people who has seen this and uh, who believes in this. 